Well, thank you, Father Kaz. It's always to have uh, mercy from our presenter to us, right? So you, you, were, you were very merciful to me, Father Kaz. But anyway, one thing is true. Our Lord also um, gives me many graces. And one of the graces that I have is to be with you here. This is the first time I speak about this subject to health professional care people. So for me, it's, it, it is really a privilege and an honor to be here again for the second time. So I was here yesterday and today. So for those of you who were here yesterday, um, thank you for your patience, your courage, and your you know, persistence in being here listening to me. Yes, because my English is not what it was supposed to be. And for those who are here the first time, um, why to speak about Mary devotion in a Congress dedicated to healthcare professionals? Well, yesterday one of our speakers uh, said something that really touched my heart and it's really the introduction why uh, I was invited to speak about this in this Congress. Our speaker said, she was talking about spiritual care, and she said spiritual self-care helps in providing patient-centered care, spiritual self-care, so to take care of our own spirituality, helps preparing us for difficult situations. And she also says that without us who are taking care of others, don't take care about our own spirituality, it, when we do that, when we help ourselves with our spirituality, then this helps us maintaining the ability to provide compassionate care. So uh, the introduction of this talk, and that's why I was invited from Marie and Father Kaz, was this simple principle. If we do not take care of our spiritual life, we will not be the best professional cares we are supposed to be, okay? If we don't take care of our relationship with Jesus, we will not be the instruments of his compassion and mercy and healing like he wants us to be. So uh, that's why I am fully comfortable to speaking about devotion to Our Lady uh, in this national, in this conference, in this health professional conference. So of course they invite me to speak about Our Lady of Fatima and the message of Fatima, because I know Marie, she was really willing me to come here last year in the centennial of the anniversary of the apparitions, but I couldn't come because you know all the work with the canonization. But I told her my mistake, I can go next year. And she said, okay, <laughs> so here I am again, which did not become a mistake, but a great grace for me. So here I am trying to present, or, um, and yes, Dr. Ron, yesterday you did a little bit of my work. So for those of you who were here yesterday, you already know the apparitions, right? So I'm only underlying of these apparitions, what is um, to be devoted to Our Lady of Fatima or uh, what aspects of Maria devotion in the message of Fatima are underlined and how they can help us in our spiritual life, okay? So, uh, one question that Saint Francisco Marto, not the Pope, I'm sorry for the picture, I changed the picture, I'm not good with these things, but anyway, Francisco, little Francisco, the visionary, Saint Francisco Marto, as, as you know, um, he couldn't hear Our Lady, he could only see. That is also a good characteristic because those who only can see, as you know, they can give us many details, many more details than those who can see and listen because they only have one sense and they are focused. So Francisco was always the one who described the better what they saw in the apparition. So he makes these remarkable questions. This question, why did Our Lady have a heart in her hand spreading out over the world that great light which is God? This is the most important question we are trying to answer here. And as you see, in the question is already the answer. Why Our Lady is coming to Fatima or to the world to spreading the great light that is God? So when we speak about Our Lady in Fatima, we immediately are um, taken, you know, driven to Jesus. So everything started from the point of view of Lucia with a question, okay? Lucia on May 13 uh, said, ask Our Lady this, where are you from? So in other words, Lucia wanted to know 
who was this lady, right? It's beautiful that our lady did not say exactly, okay, she said I'm from heaven, but she did not say exactly whom she was. She answered in this um, interesting way. I came to ask you to come here on the 13th of each month for the next six months, and then I will tell you who I am and what I want. So basically, Lucia was making the first question, who are you? Like when I came here, Father Kaz introduced me, right? He said who I was and so on. Our lady didn't do that. She asks first for the encounter, I want you to come here for six months. Then she will tell us uh, whom she is. Which from the beginning, I'm telling you this, please, I know I, well, I don't know you. I don't know if you are very devoted to Our Lady or not, okay? But even if you are not, if, if, if you are, it's okay. If you are not, it's okay too, but it's time to change. So, <laughs> and we change now, with the grace of our Lord. No, I'm, I know, I'm kidding, okay? I don't want to offend anyone, please. You know me. You know me by now. So, but it's, it's interesting, this dynamic. You know, all of us, or most of us, we have... Um, very deep scientific formation, right? And we want to know everything by our minds in order to decide if we do or don't do, right? I remember when I was a postulant and, or a, still a candidate to my community, I was talking to my superior and me being a student in a medical school, I wanted to know every little thing logically about God, you know, in order for me to decide if I accept or not, right? And I was making questions and questions and questions to my founder, to my superior. And in one moment, she couldn't do it anymore. You know, I was an intellectual person, or I thought I was. And I was making all these questions, and she said, Angela, God is not like in the mathematic. You know, in mathematic, you know, A plus B equals C, right? Do you follow me? He says, with God is not like that. Sometimes you are called to accept the C, and then eventually he will tell you the A and the B. This logic was very hard for me, but I can see the same logic in Fatima. Who are you? Asked Lucia. Our lady said, come here, meet with me, and eventually you will be able to understand who am I. So do not expect to understand everything about Our Lady or the Rosary in order to, ex to start to love and to pray, okay? Just do it. And eventually, you will understand why it's so important. Was I clear? Yes. Okay, so I heard, I, more, than, more than listening with your intelligence, I ask you to listen with your heart, okay? So, as we know, and I know you know this, but let me just be very clear. In Fatima, we are talking about a private revelation, or a revelation with a small r, which is something approved by the church, that if it is approved, it's because it points to the public revelation, so the revelation of Jesus and God, that is in the Gospel, in the Bible, okay? So if Fatima is approved, it's because there is nothing new theologically, but points to some aspects of the public revelation. And we know that one of the aspects most important of all there is underlined in Fatima is the presence and the action of the mother of Jesus in the life of the church and in the history of humanity. I have to tell you very briefly that almost all our dogmas of our Catholic Church are present in the message of Fatima, okay? The dogma of the Most Holy Trinity, the Eucharistic dogma, the mystical body of the church, scathology. In Fatima, we speak about hell, heaven, purgatory. Communion of saints, the grace, the virtues. So most of the dogmas of our Catholic faith are present in the message of Fatima. Also the Marian dogma. So it's nothing new about Our Lady that is said in the message of Fatima, okay? So if Fatima was approved by the church, is because points to the gospel. And in this particular case that brought us here today, points to the importance of Mary of Nazareth, the mother of Jesus, you know, our dear lady, in the life of the church and in our personal life or in the history of the world. 
does my small history, my personal history, and the big history of the world. And this is, yes, uh, a great moment in the history of the apparitions approved by the church where all these aspects of Maria devotion are present, okay? So, my work or my investigation while I was doing this research, my aim was really to go to the gospel and find three texts, three passages of the gospels that we can find them in Fatima. Am I explaining myself well? We will see here very clear. In the, in the gospel, as you know, or in the scripture, Our Lady is presented as the woman that in Cana intercedes for us and shows us the way. Chapter two of you know, the, the Gospel of John, right? In Fatima, I can see that because Our Lady presented herself with her immaculate heart. And I am trying to show you how does her immaculate heart in Fatima really points out her mission at the feast wedding at Cana. Also, in the Gospel, in two parts of the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter two, we see Our Lady that is keeping everything in her heart. Do you remember, do you recall these words? And we hear this twice in Bethlehem, when the shepherd came to adore Jesus, Our Lady was so surprised how suddenly these men are coming with gifts. And the Gospel said, Luke says, she kept everything in her heart. And again in Jerusalem, in the finding and losting of Jesus in the temple, Our Lady was so surprised with the reaction of her son that the Gospel, Luke says, she kept everything in her heart. So in the Gospel, we see this woman keeping everything in her heart, meditating, reflecting. In Fatima, we hear that she is the Lady of the Rosary. And we will see how our Lady of the Rosary points us to this attitude of heart, keeping everything in our heart. Finally, and I which I have time to go through all this, one of the most important aspects for me that in Fatima is, is referred, even though it's not so obvious. The way Lucia and Francisco and Jacinta described Our Lady the most was a woman more brighter or brighter than the sun. A woman dressed in white. You know, white, light, sun are three of the most frequent words to describe Our Lady. Shining, radiant. And this, looking to the apparitions, points to that great moment when Our Lady, the Mother of Jesus, was given to be our Mother at the feet of the cross. So we will see how these three uh, scripture moments are illuminated by Fatima. So let's start with the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The references to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the message of Fatima are from the beginning to the end. And when I'm talking about Fatima, you know, usually, like I said to Maria and Father Kaz, I, I give, we have prepared a seven hour talk about Fatima, seven hour. I have a seven, seven hours, seven talks. Next year. Next year? <laughs> okay. <laughs> for them, no. But you see, I'm trying to squeeze a seven hour formation in one hour. Can you see this? It is impossible. But we can see, uh, when we speak about the message of Fatima, like Dr. Ron clearly said yesterday, we are, we are talking about the period of 13 years of apparition. 1916, the angel, 1917, Our Lady, to the three chapter children, 1925, Ponte Vedra, 1929, in two in Spain, just to Sister Lucia. All of this, 1629, is the message of Fatima, okay? And from the beginning to the end, the word immaculate heart, heart of Mary, is present. So it's a constant in the message of Fatima. Starts with the angel. Pray thus, the hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplication. Two ideas we get from here. Mary always united with Christ. Hearts of Jesus and Mary. So she's not driving us away from Jesus, of course. She's in union with him. And for like someone who are listening to our prayers, not only listen, but attentive, okay? So like, you know, I, I know we are in a divine mercy field and I know you know this, but sometimes it's um, useful to remind people, they always listen to our prayers. They always 
um, collect our prayers. Sometimes they do not do what we want because definitely it's not the best. But there is not a single prayer that goes to them that do not arrive them and they care. Okay? Need to have this trust. And then, and I know this is very dear to you, I will speak about this tomorrow in the Congress of, in, in Stockbridge, the Divine Mercy. Uh, I will start from here. In the second apparition of the angel, what are you doing? Pray, pray very much. The hearts of Jesus and Mary have designs of mercy upon you. Isn't this familiar? Designs of mercy upon you. From the beginning, Fatima is an announcement of God's mercy towards us. And finally, in the famous th third, appari or third apparition of the angel, when he gave them the Eucharist, he taught them the new prayer, and in one moment, in the end, says, um, and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg you the conversion of the poor sinners. So Our Lady, as someone who is interceding for the conversion of poor sinners. But the most important message, according to the um, heart of Mary, is the second one, or the apparition of June, that I'm li like to show you. But instead of just making you read, I'll tell you the story. I'm better telling the story than reading in English, okay? So here we are, May. The end of the apparition of May, which I told you a little bit yesterday. In the end of the apparition, Our Lady makes the most important question, which we know how, how was that question. Are you willing to offer yourselves to God? Remember that question? Okay, the funny thing is, the first apparition of the angel, he asks for prayers. The second apparition of the angel, he asks something else, sacrifices. But the first apparition of, of Our Lady, she asks for everything. Are you willing to offer yourselves, not only your prayers, not only your sacrifices, your entire life? This is a question that, to whom all of us need to answer, okay? In the silence of our hearts, with our lives, are you willing to offer yourselves to God? You know, we know the answer, yes, we are willing. Lucia was very courage, okay? Of course like all of us in the beginning of our vocations, right? No matter it is priesthood, the religious life, married life, yes, I will be faithful to you. In the beginning of our mission as doctors, nurses, right? Yes, I will, full of courage. Okay, Our Lady then said, then you will suffer a great deal, but the grace of our Lord will be your comfort. She announced suffering. Many people come to me and say, come on, sister, Our Lady was not a little bit tough. I mean, immediately after a yes, she's saying, you will suffer. You know, I think Our Lady is quoting Jesus. In other words, when Jesus said in the gospel, who wants to follow me? Deny yourselves, take your cross and follow me. It's exactly the same idea, so nothing new. See, nothing new in Fatima. You will suffer, but the grace of our Lord will be our comfort. Okay, what, what happened in the end of his apparition, we have to think about, because it makes us understand the apparition of June. Jacinta, she was seven years old, all excited. What a beautiful lady. And Lucia, more prudent, 10 years old, said, Jacinta, we will keep secret about this. And Jacinta, yes, yes, I promise, I'm not saying a word to anyone. Oh, but she was so beautiful. So for two miles, Jacinta was hopping, you know, between what a beautiful lady. Okay, okay, I promise I'm not saying anything. Don't worry, don't worry. Oh, but what a beautiful lady. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Two miles, seven-year-old girl. So when she arrived to her mom, what was the first thing she said? First, mom, we saw our lady, this beautiful lady in the cova. So the word was spread. Let me just tell you something about this. Lucia then, she was very sad with Jacinta. Why? Because Francisco and Jacinta's parents believe immediately. Lucia's parents, they did not believe, especially the mother. Okay, Lucia was the youngest one of six brothers and sisters. She was like the star of the family, you know? The most sweet, the most, you know, the youngest, the baby. And uh, suddenly her mother calls Lucia and said, Lucia, is it true what your cousin is saying? That you saw our lady? She said, yes, mom, we did. <laughs> it is a lie, because you are not good enough to see the Blessed Mother. And we do not deserve this grace, so you are a liar. 
So Lucia, let's go. Go to Jacinta and tell, why did you speak? And Jacinta said, you know something, Lucia? I had something in my heart. I couldn't be quiet. I had this passion. Do you follow me? And this became, this made Jacinta the first testimony of the message of Fatima. Why? Because she had something inside her. This is the resurrection effect in our lives. Am I being clear? Why are we witnesses of Christ? Because we have something inside us that does not allow us to keep quiet. And why? Because so many people leave the church. Because we don't have that thing inside us. And make us feel lukewarm. Do you know the word lukewarm? It's a horrible word, right? And some of us are like that. Jacinta was not lukewarm. That's why she, she couldn't help. She saw. It's like the disciples in the, um, going to Emmaus, remember, in the evening of the resurrection, when they saw Jesus, they said to each other, had we not this fire inside us? That's why Mary Magdalene came out to see the apostles. I saw. So when someone really experiences Jesus, we cannot be quiet. This was Jacinta, okay? Why did she speak? Because she had something inside her. She couldn't be quiet. But nevertheless, the problems for Lucia started that same day. You will suffer a great deal. Lucia did not know this, that the sufferings would start that same day. And never more, her life was the same. Never, until she died with 97 years old. So one month from May to June, Lucia started to be spanked by her mother, who wanted her to tell the truth that she did not see Our Lady. You know, the lands uh, in the, where the, the, the tree was, though that property belonged to Lucia, and the pilgrims coming to pray by the tree, you know, they would damage all the farming. So if they were poor, they become even more poor. Can you see the difference of the life? So in, if in May they answer, are you willing to offer yourselves to God? Yes, we are. June, after one month of suffering, First request of Lucia, I would like you to take us to heaven. You know, that's it. <laughs> no more. She was so tired of suffering. And the beautiful thing is that Our Lady answered. She said, yes, to Francisco and Jacinta, I'll take them to heaven very soon. But you will stay here a little bit longer. You know, until when was this a little bit longer? until 2005. She was 97 years old, so I think God knows nothing about our time. <laughs> there is something that I think about, you know, a little bit longer. And she says, why? And the moment for Lucia is solemn. She's just about knowing her vocation. You will stay here because Jesus wishes to use you to make me known and love. He wants to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. For this 10-year-old girl is the greatest moment. She's knowing her vocation. But we can see by her answer that she did not care for her vocation. She's just heard the first part, Francisco and Jacinta are going to die. So she turns to Our Lady and she says, am I going to stay here alone? This is amazing. Lucia puts the question of one of the greatest sufferings of everybody. We feel alone sometimes, don't we? Sometimes we feel, even if we have a great husband, wife, great religious community, sometimes we just feel nobody really knows me and understands me. Like Jesus, sometimes feel her loneliness. So for all of us who somehow experience this loneliness, and please, take my word, I, I don't care if you forget everything I said, okay? Just don't forget Our Lady's answer to Lucia. Okay, am I going to stay here by myself? Our Lady said, no, I will never leave you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. And I can assure you, after reading the diary of Sister Lucia, that this was the greatest consolation of her, her life. No matter what the loneliness was, no matter what the suffering, she knew that the Immaculate Heart of Mary was her refuge 
and the way that lead her to God. But this is the same for us, okay? Because Fatima was not only for Lucia. You know, this grace is for the entire church. So am I going to stay here by myself? Yes. No, I will never leave you. My heart will be a refuge and the way that will take you to God. But in the apparition of July, if in June we see the private dimension of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in our life, okay? Our refuge and the way to God. In the apparition of July, oh, I'm sorry, we are still in this apparition. Oh, it's funny, it doesn't go. So I want to say here, <laughs> okay, it's okay. Why it doesn't go, it's so cute. I can see the next apparition, but you don't. Never happened to me, okay, blessed mother, that's it. We stay there. We stay with our immaculate heart to be our refuge and the way to God. <laughs> but in July, I'll do it again. I want July nevertheless. Isn't this funny? This never happened to me before. Okay, I'll just go on. Are you still with me? I know this by heart, that's your problem, you know? You, you cannot have a break. <laughs> In the apparition of July, Our Lady gives the world dimension of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Because, you know, after the, the secret of Fatima, the first, the second, and the third part, the first part of the secret, as we know, is the vision of hell. The second part of the secret is the importance of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the history of salvation. She saw, you saw hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If what I say is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. If what I tell you is not done, then it will come a second world war even worse. Russia will spread the earth throughout the world and so on and so on and so on. So if in June we see the, the private dimension of the importance of Mary, her heart, in July we see the world dimension of the importance of the Immaculate Heart of Mary by these two words, salvation and peace. Okay? You saw hell. If, if, my immaculate, if what I say is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. So what is to have devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary? Okay, think, think with me. Let's go to the Cana. What is Our Lady saying to Jesus in the feast wedding of Cana, they have no wine, right? They have no wine. What Our Lady said to Lucia, that her heart will be, my heart will be your refuge and the way that we take it to God. What means her heart is our refuge? That she is still, right now, in front of God, interceding for us. She keeps saying, they have no wine. She keeps going on, they have no peace. They have no, that's why she, Our Lady, to us, is our refuge. Because she's still presenting to our Lord our needs. Now the second part and will be the way that will take you to God. Yes, then I can accept. It's a little more tough to understand. But I will let myself be helped by Cardinal Ratzinger. Okay, Cardinal Ratzinger, as a prefect of the Congregation of the Faith, in the year 2000, made a theological comment on the third part of the secret. As a matter of fact, he made the comment of all the secret, okay? And he's trying to explain. And in one moment, he says, you know, we saw hell, we see the, the world war, and suddenly the solution that God presents to all of this, it's a surprise solution for someone who comes from the Anglo-Saxonic tradition. So who is coming from the Anglo-Saxonic tradition? Cardinal Ratzinger. So he himself admits, being a German, you no, know, a German man, he admits, being a German theologian, for me, they, I came from an Anglo-Saxonic tradition, the solution given by God to peace in the world and salvation is a surprise. And the solution is devotion to the Immaculate Art of Mary. Do you follow me? Okay, I'm close this. <laughs> because he's not following me. Okay, think with me. This is very important. Why do I love Cardinal Ratzinger? 
because he did not say the solution proposed by God by salvation is and peace is strange for a German mentality so let's forget it no he says the solution is strange let's face it am I being clear so he did not jump out of the way like okay the solution seems strange so maybe the shepherd children were wrong maybe it's not exactly that way no he said even though the solution it's surprising I will face it so how does he explain true devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary okay he says when in the Bible is the word heart of Mary or the word heart means the whole person not our myocardial muscle that can has infraction and so on okay so when in the Bible or when we speak about the heart of Mary we speak about the whole her entire personality her intelligence her free will her desires her memories her affection feelings okay so when we say that the heart of Mary is immaculate we are not only saying that she had a privilege of being the immaculate conception but that she kept faithful to that privilege how she was all her life immaculate because all her heart mind intelligent heart hence everything was around one attitude that was the cell the center of her own existence and this attitude we know by the incarnation what is she saying to the angel let it be done according to God's will do you follow me the word in Latin is fiat so why Mary was immaculate in her heart because because all of her intelligence all her decisions free will affections memories everything was around this attitude of heart that was let it be done according to your will so the Cardinal Ratzinger explains what is to have devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary it's to imitate her in this attitude of heart in such a way that my fiat to the will of the Lord becomes the self my center of my whole existence and that is true devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. My dear friends, I'm going to tell you a story. When I became my preaching career, it was like 20 years ago, okay? I started in Portugal, as obvious, and believe me, 22 years ago, Fatima was not very popular in my country, okay? So, I had uh, my first audience, five old ladies, <laughs> five. Three were sleeping. <laughs> And two could not listen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So one of these ladies was smiling to me, and I was looking at her, and she was smiling at me. And so all my talk was for this lady, okay? Because she was the only one really looking at me. And in the end, she said, "Sis," I said, "So did you enjoy the talk?" She said, "Yeah. Well, I couldn't listen to everything, but I like your smile." <laughs> so, so this is okay. Since 98, I'm coming to the United States, and I have to tell you, uh, I learned now to speak about Fatima in your country because of this. I mean, you are, you come, and you are interested. So it was really a, a blessing for me until one day, one of the trip, 2000 something, the only time I spoke to a Portuguese community, and I was happy. I mean, I was giving this talk in my language, you know? I was so excited, you know? So uh, it was a lunchtime, and okay, lunchtime. So here they have having this Portuguese food that I really don't can't like, cozida portuguesa Isabel. So it's like, Ugh. because it's a Portuguese kind of food, but I don't like it very much. And here they are, and, and here I am trying to talk about our lady, and they were eating. Yeah, all the time. Uh, and I was making the effort, and, and suddenly I said, oh, please, can you pass me the rice? Uh, okay, the rice. Okay, so I was making my effort, and one of the little boys, poor, poor him, he was feeling sorry for me. And he said, oh, sister, come on. And one of the ladies also looked at me and said, sister, and this made me understand everything. Don't worry. We know Fatima. We know our lady. You know, we go there every year to the sanctuary of Fatima. We bring some flowers. We lead some candles. We know everything. Can you see the difference? 
The devotion to Our Lady is not about bringing flowers, even though flowers are important, but is a secondary element. Devotion to Our Lady is not about lit a candle, even though candles are signs of our faith, but is secondary. Cardinal Reitzinger points the essential of devotion to Our Lady is to imitate her in this attitude of heart in such a point that our fiat becomes the center of our entire life. Intelligence, desires, free will, memories, affections. Am I, do you follow me? Until then, it's just a superficial thing. And only when we imitate her in this attitude, let it be done according to her word, we really are listening to her word in Cana. What is she saying to the disciples? Do everything he tells you. This is true devotion to Our Lady, okay? Is to imitate her in her immaculate heart, means the attitude of the heart, well, the self, uh, the fiat becomes the conforming attitude of my entire life. So far, so clear. Yeah, but this lady also tells us, let me look to the clock. I'm fine. Keep going. Don't say that. <laughs> because I can do keep going. Okay, let's go to the second part, the Lady of the Rosary. It's amazing because in Luke, these two sentences, this heart kept everything, you know, Our Lady kept everything in her heart. It said, in Bethlehem, in Jerusalem. Bethlehem, the beginning of the life of Christ, you know, out, you know, as a baby. Jerusalem, also the end of the life of Christ as a human being. You know my words, right? Because it was in Jerusalem that he died, that he resurrected, that ascended into heaven. So what is Our Lady keeping in her heart? All the mysteries of Christ from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. What that means, what is she keeping in her heart? The mysteries of Christ. This is the rosary, my friends. And it's beautiful because Our Lady in May did not say whom she was, but she said, I want you to pray the rosary when you can. Oh, no, no, when you have time. I forgot those words in English, Marie. I want you to pray the rosary on the Saturdays. No. What did she say? I want you to pray the rosary? Every day. Every day. Did she say that? Yes, she did. You can be sure about that, okay? I want you to pray the rosary every day. The funny thing was, Francisco and Jacinta as Lucia, as you know, they were children, so they want to pray the rosary because the parents told them. They want to obey, but they want to play. And all the time was not enough to play, so they had a short version, as you know, right? It was like, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, <laughs> ten times. Then very calm and solemn, Our Father. Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary. So, two minutes the rosary was said. As you see, they were normal children, okay? I love this. So after this apparition, I want you to pray the rosary every day. Jacinta said, probably it's better if we just say the whole Hail Mary. So they start to pray the rosary well after May 30. So they keep going praying the rosary every day. In June, Our Lady said again, I want you to pray the rosary every day. So they kept going. In July, I want you to keep going to pray the rosary every day in order to obtain the end of the war and the coming of the peace because only she can help you. And they kept praying the rosary. In August, the same thing, pray the rosary every day. So they did. In September, the same thing. So in October, when she came and she said, I am Our Lady of the Rosary, they got it. Do you understand? First, the encounter, then the understanding. This is, my friends, Joseph, Cardinal Ratzinger, or uh, Pope Benedict, is in his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est. Number one, he said this same dynamic. Becoming a Catholic or a Christian is not a matter of decision of my mind, right? It's a meeting, a personal encounter with a living person, Jesus. Then we make the decision. Unless we truly become an experience with Jesus, we truly don't become Catholics. Maybe I'm telling the story, right, Father Casimir? I think you like this story. Well, the good thing about not having a PowerPoint is I can tell the stories I want. <laughs> the bad thing, I have to run. Okay, but um, 
Okay, this is really about Fatima and about Our Lady and about the Rosary. Uh, many years ago, I was mistress of novice. Are you familiar with the concept? So I was in charge of the formation of the youngest sisters. I'm not anymore. So I was, you know, banished from the job. No, I'm teasing. Anyway, I was superior, so very young. Um, you know, I want the best for my novices. We had novices, and so thanks be to God. So my, our spiritual director just passed away. So I was looking for another one. Somebody spoke to me about this great priest that I did not know. So I would invite him, and I made, I was the first one going to spiritual direction. Do you know? I want to know if he was good enough. Am I being clear? Father Kazan, Father Seraphim, you are great. I chose you, but I did not know this priest. So here I am making my confession. I'm not going to share my sins. <laughs> but in the end, this holy priest told me with a beautiful smile, sister, do you know what is your problem? <laughs> so can you imagine me with my medical mentality, right? Diagnosis, <laughs> then treatment, <laughs> then I'll be fine. Because I knew there was a spiritual problem. I said, no, Father, what is? Think about this. I was a very important person, OK? Superior and mistress of novice. And he said, smiling, sister, your problem is you don't have faith. Ooh, exactly. I was like, what? Well, I did not say this, but I, inside, even worse. So. <laughs> Anyway, I'm better, you know. So he, he tried to explain, also for his own health, <laughs> he tried to explain what's going on. And he gave me one of the best uh, important lessons of my life that connects to Fatima. He says, sister, remember? And he told me the story about the Samaritan woman by the well, John Forth. When she meets Jesus, remember the dialogue, she becomes a little bit arrogant. Now, who are you to ask me to drink? And then she goes on with the dialogue, and in the end, she, she assumes he, he, you are the Messiah. Gospel of John goes on saying that she went to Samaria and told the Samaritan people, I found a man who told me everything that I did. He is the Messiah. And it's interesting, the words, the Samaritan people believing in the words of the woman, believing in the words, ask Jesus to come. Jesus stood with them for two days. And in the end, these people said to the Samaritan woman, no longer because of your words we believe he's the Messiah, but we saw, we heard, we touched, we experienced that he is the Messiah. So my spiritual director said, sister, all of us, how do we start to be believers? Because someone spoke to us about Jesus, our parents, our catechists, whatever. Does this make these people of faith? Not yet. This makes us believers. We believe based on other words. Until the point we do our own experience of Jesus, personal, then we become people of faith. And you know, my friends, why many people abandon the Catholic Church when there are scandals? Sometimes our own scandals. Why? Because they were just based their faith upon other people's words. Do you follow me? So what he was telling me is basically, Angela, you still do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. And this was true, you know? So what is Our Lady doing in Fatima? When she was, you know, with her hands always like this, in the end of May, that same question, are you willing to offer yourselves to God? Yes, we are. And Dr. Ron, you presented yesterday very well in one of the slides. She opened her hands and communicated them a light so intense, Lucia describes, that penetrated in the innermost of our hearts, and that light was God. So we felt on our knees and pray, most holy trinity, we adore you. Our, my Lord, my Lord, we love you. So they are in front of the Blessed Mother and they are praying to God. Why? Because that light was God. They made their personal experience of Jesus and they changed completely. So until, from that point on, they became little children of faith, with a great faith. Am I explaining myself? So what is Our Lady? When we pray the rosary, what does happen to our heart? She involves us with her light. And we slowly 
have the possibility to make the experience of God through Our Lady's, ha Our Lady's hands. This is the message of Fatima for our world. That's why Pope Benedict calls Fatima a school of faith. That's what he said to our bishops in 2017 in the Visita ad Limina, a school of faith. So, this lady asks us to pray the rosary every day. So what is to pray the rosary? What is the importance? I only underline two aspects, okay? Or the third one is peace in the world, definitely. One is about our configuration with Christ, which is our sanctity. I think rosary is one of the most important prayers for our sanctity. Of course, the sacraments, I'm, I'm okay, the sacraments, obviously, Lexio Divina, obviously, but these prayers, and I, again, I'm telling you another story, okay? Oh, my Lord, I have so many stories of the rosary. May I, okay. Uh, Marie, you know my community. We have a tiny little community in Fatima. So little that we have to build a new one, thanks be to God. But this happened before. I was still a novice. We were 14 women, young women, in this tiny little community. Okay, do you follow this? From the chapel to the kitchen, literally 10 steps. Okay, here I am, I'm joining my order. It was so hard for me to leave my family, my career, whatever, that I said, Lord, now that I'm following you with your grace, I want to become a saint. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so here I am, trying to think about, think, okay, me. Okay, in order to become a saint, I need to be a good religious. But before being a good religious, I have to be a good Catholic, okay? Easy. I thought, easy, good Catholic, good nun, a saint. Okay, here I am in front of the tabernacle, but always with my mind, let's see what it is to be a good Catholic, so I go to the gospel. I said, okay, keep the commandments. Hmm, not enough. Because that young man came to Jesus and says, good Lord, why do I need to go to heaven? Keep the commandments. That I do. Then you are missing something. So I thought, okay, keeping the Ten Commandments, do you follow me? Keep the Ten Commandments is not enough. Okay, so I kept going. Do God's will, be good, be kind. You know, I was looking for all the answers, but not yet satisfied since. Until the moment I was in St. Paul. And then my problems begin. So if you do not want problems, please just skip the letters of St. Paul. <laughs> skip it. I was there and St. Paul explains me that become a saint or be a saint or be a good Christian, not only to follow Christ, because even Peter, in the night he denied Jesus, he was following Christ. The gospel says from apart, you know, he was in a distance. But St. Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians, he says, become like Christ. So I said, easy, I will become like Christ. Then I go to the letter of the Philly, Philippians. I always say to the Philippines, but it's not, right? Even though the Philippines can listen to this letter, <laughs> but it's not Philippines. I'm always confusing with these words. Philippians, he says, have in yourself the same feeling as Christ. Do you recall this passage? Have, in your, have within you the same feeling. So I said, easy. I have the same feelings of Jesus. I become like Jesus. I'll be holy. So here I am, this day of illumination. This was my illumination in the chapel, doing morning prayer. Okay? And I said, Jesus, today I'm a novice. I will be like you. I will be kind to all my sisters. I will be smiling. I will forgive every little thing. I will be, you know, so on and so on like you. And I said, I will be. Ten steps later, <laughs> we are in the kitchen. Okay, breakfast, 14 women full of angry, hungry, you know, breakfast, before breakfast. We only had a microwave, okay? So that's what I called the morning conquer of the microwave. <laughs> with my cup of coffee, you know? I was in the line, I was waiting, you know? I was being patient, and suddenly when my time comes, you know, I'm just putting my cup, and one sister skips the line and puts the cup in front of mine, you know? She just jumps into the microwave. She does not respect my position in the line, and she just goes. Do you know where the feelings of Christ went? <laughs> I became so furious.
serious? That I was like, what are you doing? Just be in line. I mean, wait, I'm waiting. You can wait too. Who are you? Doing? You just respect me, okay? I mean, I, the poor sister, she was so overwhelmed. She was, I'm sorry. And I was, you know, it was my first vocational crisis. I had so many that I became an expert in vocational crisis. But this one, really, I was, I can, I will never make it. I mean, if I, if I am not patient just because one of my sisters skipped the line, I mean, I will not do it. I, I'm sure those things never happen to you, right? Okay, but for me, so I says, I'm leaving the order because if I cannot become like Christ, I will not become a nun, I will not stay here. I'll take care of my patients. It is so funny how, how you know, how the devil works. So I tried to speak with my mistress of novice, my spiritual director, but no one could help me, you know, like, um, okay, um, but then where is, okay, so on, so on, make a long story short, 2002, Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul saved my life because he published a letter on the Most Holy Rosary. I encourage you to read his letter on the Most Holy Rosary, number 15. It says this, I, I'm knowing, I hope I'm saying it right, okay? In, in Portuguese, I know by heart, but it says, the rosary mystically transports us to Mary's side. And this enables her to train us and to mold us with the same care like she did to Jesus until Christ is fully formed in us. And he's quoting the letter to the Galatians. I'll say it again. The rosary mystically transports us to Mary's side. And this enables her, she is the one who do the job with the Holy Spirit, not we, okay? That was my problem. Everything was about me. Me doing, me willing, you know? It was not about God in my life. That was the problem. Sometimes with us who are very intellectual people, that's our problem. It's everything about us, our formation, our training, our decisions. And where is God working? Like he said to Sister Faustina, humility, it's all about God. But I need to learn that lesson. So the rosary transports us. So my part, what am I supposed to do? I pray the rosary. And this brings me to Mary's side. And this enables her to train me and to mold me, listen carefully, until Christ is fully formed in us. Not until she is fully formed in us. That's the secret. What does she do in our life? She makes my soul with the Holy Spirit become like Christ. And that is sanctity. And I remember, I think, Blessed Mother, the rosary, I can do it. So you take care of the rest that I cannot do. So why the rosary is important daily? And why? Because we praying the rosary, we contemplate with her eyes what is keeping her, her heart, the mysteries of Christ. Do you follow me now? So, and, and finally, I have five more minutes? No, uh, I just have one idea more, but may, may I tell you another story about the rosary? Okay, so peace in the world, configuration with Christ, and another thing that I think is very important. Okay, 2013, um, well, 2012, I became a postulator of Francisco and Jacinta, so Roman postulator, and Cardinal Amato, he made my nomination, but I had to do a three months formation in Rome, okay? I had to. For me, I'm living in Fatima. It was my first time in my entire life I was away of the sisters because we don't have a community in Rome. It was too expensive. I couldn't bring one sister in. So I was by myself in Rome, even if it was in the Portuguese college with a group of sisters, but the word, they were not my sisters, okay? So I was complaining. 2013, see, I'm still complaining. <laughs> Okay, January, I start to complain. January, February, and March 2013. And I'm complaining, oh, I am here, I'm here by myself. Why do not I study in home? And then I come and take the exam. You know, complaining. I miss my sisters. I'm sure they miss me. I hope they miss me. <laughs> Until February 11, 2013. You know what happened in February 11? John uh, Benedict XVI um, resigned. Sede vacante started, so I realized I was living in Rome, one of the most incredible moments of the history of the church. So stop complaining. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. February 28, okay, I was in the Portuguese college where the priests from Portugal study right behind the Vatican, 
February 28, I had a brilliant idea. <laughs> 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock p.m. was the official beginning of Sede Vacante, so when we had no more Pope, okay? So I had this brilliant idea, and I thought I would be the only one. Uh, I'm going to the Piazza, St. Peter's Square, to pray. Okay, here I am, by myself, very romantic. Of course, when I arrived to St. Peter's Square, <laughs> Thousands of people had the same brilliant idea, <laughs> and the, the piazza was full of people. So, and I was by myself. So I looked to this group of people, and I have to tell you, they were from the North American College. How do I know? Black suit, clergyman, backpack, and tennis shoes. <laughs> Only Americans dressed like this. I love this. So I said, well, I'm, I'm right father, law like that. It's so beautiful. It's so interesting. So I joined them because I can understand a little bit of English. But they, 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 they were a big group. And they were doing a Lexio Divina. And I was so happy because, you know, they were doing You Are Peter and the Pondies Rock, I established my church. But the thing is, open air, big group, they were sharing. I couldn't listen to everything. I couldn't understand something. So somehow, in those circumstances, I could not feel myself, you know, involved in the prayer. So in the other side of the piazza, I saw a small group and I joined them. French. Even worse, I don't speak French. But staying there for a couple of seconds, I heard this. Je vous salue, Marie, plein de grâce, etc. I don't know the rest. <laughs> they were praying the rosary. So I said, well, even if it's in French, I understand. So I start, and the first part of the Hail Mary was in French, and the second part, French, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, and the group became larger and larger and larger, and in the end, we were thousands. Praying the rosary. We knew exactly what we were praying, the rosary. We knew exactly why we were praying for the Pope. I felt like the Pentecost. Isn't this the Pentecost? The beginning of the church, when the church is united with Mary for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and we were understanding each other even though we were speaking in our own languages, like the Pentecost. So I think that the rosary is very important in some circumstances, it's the most important prayer that makes the church. I don't know if I'm clear myself. I had a quote from John Paul II that I don't know by memory, but in 79 it says this. Another why the rosary is important, for divine mercy. It's beautiful that Pope Francis, in 2016, October the 8th, you can write down and then you check, it says the rosary is a synthesis of divine mercy. It's amazing. The rosary is the synthesis of divine mercy. So let us now conclude the talk by the third aspect. Our Lady more brighter than the sun. And why Our Lady is in the Fatima is John chapter 19. Our Lady at the foot of the cross. And why do many people trust Our Lady of Fatima? I have to say that it's because John 19. Okay, in the third part of the secret, they saw uh, the church walking, following the Pope, okay? This is the Pope and the church, all kinds of people, religious, priests, you know, the, the church walking with the Pope. They are crossing a city half in ruins and climbing a steep mountain on, on the top of the, what, of the mountain was the cross. Okay, Do you, can you see this? This is the church who walks with the Pope in the middle of a city half in ruins, but they are going to the cross. But in the same time, they saw a little bit up the angel and the Our Lady more brighter than the sun. So Our Lady was there watching the journey of the church reaching the Christ. And it's beautiful, you know, my friends, I can see how much Pope Francis understands this mystery. Because the church, even though he's going to the Christ, has to go to the ruins of the city. Am I being clear? This is our job as healthcare professionals. Mean members of the church 
but going to take care of the wounds of the people, physical wounds and spiritual wounds. We are health professional care people in this middle of this journey of the church. Because this city, half in ruins, as you know, represents our civilization, represents a human heart in ruins, represents a family in ruins. So our Lord is sending us with the Pope to this city, but who is there watching over this path towards Christ in the cross? Is the Blessed Mother. So I think this is why so many millions of people around the world really are connected to Our Lady of Fatima, because we know that now she is at the feet of my own cross. She is watching over my human um, path towards God. She's watching over the church in our path to, to Christ. And Christ is the end of the story, is also the strength for the story of personal humanity, my personal dimension, and the, the dimension of the history of humanity. So what is Fatima about? Is this announcement that the Lumen Gentium, I think number 62 or 64 says, that the mother of Christ is still taking care of the church walking through Christ's cross. And the mother of Christ is still at the feet of my cross. So everything in Fatima, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the Rosary, this woman more brighter than the sun, what this Mary, Our Lady, is doing to our life, pointing us to Jesus. And if we do so, trust her, uh, do what she asked, we can really trust in the great prior promise that she made in Fatima. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. I don't think it will be a spectacular thing. It will be silent and humble like she was, but I think she always triumphs when we, through our rosaries, consecration, reparation, open our hearts so the Holy Spirit can make our heart like the heart of Jesus. And this is the Immaculate Heart of Mary Triumph, which I desire for each one of you. Thank you very much, and God bless you for your patience. <laughs>